Hi, this is Jeff from Into the Vertical Blank. This is Make a Thing, Atari ST Kid Grid Dev Diary, number one, coming up next. It's been at least 15 years since I completed a game of my own, and more than 10 years since I was paid to finish any real game coding at all. I've only ever finished one ST game in 1990, and even though I've done a lot of tests and tutorials over the last five years on this channel, none have resulted in a complete game, and my skills have been focused on rendering. I've avoided trying to do complex data structures and game mechanics in STOS Basic. But games are more than rendering, of course. So it's time. I've spent so much time talking about other people's games that I've seemingly lost the art of developing my own. So I figured that the best way to start would be to take some inspiration from old Atari 8-bit and C64 classics and port them to the ST with some STE added upgrades where possible and get my brain going again on game development. The first game I'm going to attempt is called Kid Grid, an Amadar like game from the early 80s. Kid Grid is a grid capture video game developed by Artie Hartunian and published by Tronics in 1982 for the Atari 8 bit and Commodore 64, and it stands as a notable entry in the maze game genre. Its core gameplay mechanics are heavily inspired by the 1981 hit Amadar establishing a clear lineage in its design philosophy. The gameplay of Kid Grid centers on a straightforward yet challenging grid capture mechanic. The player controls the kid, moving along the horizontal and vertical lines of the playfield. As the player traverses these lines, they change from dotted gray to blue. The objective is to encircle and fill in all the squares on the grid there are 35 squares in total that need to be captured by coloring all the surrounding lines. The player movement is precise and confined to the grid's pathways. A crucial element in Kid Grid is the stun mechanic. By pressing the joystick button, the player can briefly stun the pursuing enemies, causing them to freeze and turn white for just a second. This temporary invulnerability allows the player to pass through the enemy without contact providing a vital escape mechanism from tight situations. The feature is directly analogous to the jump ability found in Amador, its arcade inspiration. Players begin each level with a fixed number of stuns, which can be chosen at the start of the game. Options include three, five, or seven stuns. A strategic consideration for players is that stuns refill every new level, and any unused stuns from the previous levels will stack, allowing for careful resource management across the game. Beyond the primary grid coloring objective, the game incorporates bonus elements to reward strategic play. A mysterious question mark appears randomly in some squares on the grid. Capturing these question marks by completely enclosing them within a colored square before they vanish yields significant bonus points, ranging from 100 to 500 points. However, failing to capture a question mark before its disappearance results in a penalty of 10 points. The unpredictable nature of their appearance, random in location, timing, and duration, adds a dynamic layer of risk and reward to the gameplay. Despite its engaging mechanics, a notable limitation of Kid Grid is its level structure. The game features only one maze. While players can select from five different difficulty settings at the outset, the lack of environmental variety is a common point of criticism, at least in the Atari 8-bit version. The stun mechanic's role as the player's primary defensive tool against relentless pursuers is a critical balancing element. The ability to choose the initial number of stuns and the replenishment per level underscores a deliberate design choice aimed at managing difficulty and encouraging tactical resource allocation. Replicating the precise timing and duration of enemy freeze on the Atari ST is paramount to maintaining the original game's feel and challenge. 
Amadar has both a varied maze layout per level and a bonus stage, while the C64 version has a varied layout but still based on the same grid pattern of the Atari 8-bit. Okay, starting with this basic design, I can begin working on a port to the ST in Stoss Basic. I've tried to set aside at least 30 minutes a day to work on the game, and to ensure I don't drift off and watch YouTube videos instead of working, I've recorded all of my development sessions. Sessions 1, 2, and 3. After looking at the C64 and Atari 8-bit versions of the game, I had these initial observations. Both games are on a 7x6 grid of squares, with about 6 dots on each line of each square. The ST has a 320x200 screen, which will easily accommodate this in the Stoss text plotting mode. I'll start with standard text, then create a unique font for the game based on the C64 font. I want to make the game characters bobs from the Missing Link extension, but I do realize that this type of single screen arcade game with a few animated sprites is what Vanilla Stoss eats for breakfast. For sound, I'll probably sample the Atari 8-bit and C64 or the Amadar sounds and try to find out what piece of music is played before the Atari 8-bit version starts a level. I plan to add a feature to play a mod file during gameplay for an Atari STE upgrade. Other gameplay upgrades for Kid Grid Atari ST Plus. In addition to the bonus points, the possibility of getting a power-up will occur if you capture a question mark. These would be B for a bomb that destroys all enemies on the screen, S which gives the player an extra stun, or P which speeds up the player for a limited time. As for sprites, I paused the video from YouTube and I copied both frames of animation for each C64 character so I can recreate something similar to each in the Stoss Sprite Designer. Session 4 the goal of session four was pretty simple, to test text mode on a 40 by 24 grid for speed and see how fast it draws. Well, it draws, but it draws pretty slow, so it cannot be redrawn every frame. There are a couple of ways to do this. One is to just update the parts of the screen that have changed using missing link bobs, or alternatively is to just use Stoss built-in sprites. In session five, I decided I needed a custom layout designer. So instead of making one, I did the programmer thing. Programmers are lazy. I opened up Google Sheets and formatted a sheet to accommodate the Atari 8-bit layout. The idea here was to save the data as a CSV and then use the output in a Stoss basic data statement. In session six, I had a change of pace. I had a discussion with Steve about game mechanics and code for detecting if a square has been fully captured. So I go down. Do what I'm going to see is, okay, I know the last corner I hit, and I know the current corner I hit. I know nothing else because I don't need to need, actually need to know anything else. If I don't hit this corner and I go back right. this way and hit this corner. corner, then it's not going to matter, right? Then I'll know that this is the, the original corner again, and now I'm going here. Okay. So, and then you need to record the next corner you pass over. Okay, so this is so I've, this is the corner I pass over, zero comma zero. I go down, I hit this corner. Hit this corner is now one comma zero. All I need to know is if I've gone down on the vertical, which is the one, is it one more than the last corner I hit? And the answer is yes. And is the horizontal the same value? So um, it looks like Amadar does it like in two segments so it's like if halfway through it'll draw it but it doesn't do every dot do at right. least the uh, at least Amadar for the 2600 well, for arcade. and in some cases you have to be all the way you have to be all the way over to, to so on arcade, it's like Pac-Man on arcade more looks like Pac-Man yeah no I meant the Amadar on the 2600 I know no I know that I'm just saying on the arcade doesn't like Pac-Man Kind of. like, it's almost like you're eating dots. Like you're eating dots, yeah. I see, and that, and that's what you're trying to... I mean, I think... So there's more dots to keep track of, but I think what I was telling you still makes sense, because if you know that the... La oh, I know, because now it doesn't matter. Now you just want to know if every line segment has been created. It doesn't matter 
what the last one was. Yeah. The goal of session seven was to read the data into my grid array in STOS and populate the screen. After many attempts and the screen printing sideways, I realized that basic arrays are organized opposite from CSV data. So by reading in the CSV data as y comma x instead of x comma y, I was able to display my map properly. I also decided to redo the map to add some extra room for the score panel and other non-gameplay areas. I came up with a problem in STOS though. It's with the STOS VS Code plugin. It uses labels instead of line numbers. I couldn't restore my data to a label. It gave an error. So I might want to read the level data in from disk or populate it another way. In session eight, I decided I needed a change of pace. Well, I needed a sprite anyway. So I popped open the sprite designer in STOS and made a 32 by 32 sort of copy of the C64 sprite with my own changes. Then I tried to make a bob out of it, but realized that I hadn't saved the sprite, only an empty file. Luckily, I had recorded a video of my folly, and so I remade the sprite using the video as a reference. Session 9 was supposed to be all about displaying the sprite. So I did it, but look at it, it's huge. It looks like the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man attacking New York City. So of course, I need to resize it. I also noticed that the map scrolls up one line after it's drawn. I might have to remove the bottom line of the map if I wanna use this text mode for map display. So I went into the sprite designer first and I used the reduce command to resize the sprite from 32 by 32 to 16 by 16. Then I fixed it up and made two more frames of animation for it. Ah, that looks better. Session 10, we're gonna move the bob and detect which square it's on. This session was a failure. The night before I have to start working on this video, everything seems to be failing. Tomorrow, I'll replace everything with standard STOS functions and try again. Maybe this is needed just to get my head around all this again. I didn't get this all on video. It was really boring. I started the video when I switched to fast copy in Misty from Blit in Missing Link. I added functions for getting the current tile under the sprite, but it's not 100% working yet because I got stuck trying to use the Missing Link Blit command to copy screens. There must be another function called Blit in one of the extensions and they're conflicting. Anyway, in session 11, I'll replace everything again with standard STOS functions for now. Session 11. I changed all the current code to standard STOS to get a working version. I changed the sprite hotspot to the center. I redid the sprite movement and detection for which square it's on. And it worked. It's moving around and detecting which square it's on. It's drawing the lines but you can move outside the squares. This is the type of game where standard STOS can thrive. I'll continue to explore STOS in this form as I go forward and then add in new extensions and features as needed for performance purposes. We'll continue all of this in part two. We were children of the Silicon Revolution, an X-generation conscripted to fight the console and home computer wars. 
a product of an analog 70s childhood, we came of digital age in the 80s, believing we could affect the world 8 bits at a time. Armed with joysticks, full-stroke keyboards, jolt cola, and MTV haircuts, we proceeded into the vertical blank. There, we stayed up late at night, devising incantations from D&D rulebooks and beginners' all-purpose symbolic instruction code. Video games were the match, and programming was the fuse, as the infinite possibilities of the digital world exploded into the internet age to come. We are Generation Atari. Into the vertical blank.